um, and thinking about the implementation work we were doing and trying to like really think about like what is the approach? The evidence base is going to change. What's the sort of organizational, practitioner-directed, uh, person-directed sort of efforts that we need to put in place to uh, to when we know that something should change, how we get it to change in a way that it's effective and and it's sustained. Um, and and I so I came into this when um, a lot of implementation research and associated publications were really in their infancy uh, uh, to some extent. And so you could kind of get away with like uh, teachers weren't doing this intervention and so we provided coaching and the coaching worked and now they're doing the intervention, right? Um, uh, and there was a giant proliferation of frameworks and I think of a framework in some ways as a list of variables. Uh, like here are all the things we think might be associated with implementation, but there wasn't a lot of causal model. Uh, that is that changes in variable A will lead to changes in variable B, which in turn will lead to changes in variable uh, C. And I think that in general, implementation science and the associated publications have become more sophisticated uh, uh, around this. And there are like very broadly, this is like, a very crude generalization, but there are two categories of people that are publishing this. One is our, and this is a, a, a relatively new group of people, our implementation science methodology. These are people who like are like, um, say, statisticians, uh, right, or, or expert qualitative researchers. They have, they may have a content area of interest, but what they are really interested in doing is moving the methods forward. Right? And, and are not agnostic about content, but are almost agnostic about content. And then there's a second group of people, which I think is an older guard and a larger group of people. These are people who started out usually as clinicians. There was an intervention that they tested that they thought would be really good. And um, then they realized people weren't working, using it. And they were having a hard time getting it into the community. And so they, they it was this very organic process, kind of like my process some ways, even though I'm not a clinician, I was saying, like, wow, what do I need to do to get people to use, um, to use this intervention? Um, and I would say that the discipline in general and the field is moving more towards that first group. That is, if, like, there are a lot of places to publish implementation science work, and content-related journals are becoming increasingly interested in these papers. So you, you, like the first question you need to ask yourself when you're thinking about publishing is, do I have a specific implementation question that I'm trying to answer? That is not about the content I'm trying to get people to answer, right? So if I'm like using implementation as really part of an effectiveness design, right? I want, I want, I want a certain group of practitioners to use an intervention and I assume it's gonna result in a better outcome and that's really my focus. And so I'm using what we might think of as traditional implementation strategy. Like I am training them, I'm providing consultation, I'm providing a financial incentive. Um, and I do those things and it results in a change in their behavior and a change in outcome, right? That's great. And I probably wanna think about targeting a content-specific journal for that, or a more generalist journal, because those are becoming less interesting questions in implementation science, right? In implementation science, they're like, what's different about your consultation model than any other consultation model? What's different about your instruct incentive structure than any other incentive structure? What's different about the organizational level variables that you are trying to leverage or the practitioner level variables that you're trying to leverage as we move towards more causal modeling in implementation science? And did you measure not just whether people use the intervention the way it was designed and whether outcomes got better, but those mediating variables that might be associated with successful implementation, right? So that you are moving the science forward. So I guess another way to pose that first question is, which science are you moving forward? Are you moving forward your content-specific science or are you like in 
heart disease or mental health or diabetes care, or are you moving implementation plans? So let's say you feel like, well, I kind of, I did something novel for my implementation strategy, um, and I could tell you the specific implementation question I'm answering and how it advances implementation science. The next question you need to ask yourself is what is the causal model that is undergirding my work? Not just the framework, not just the list of variables, but what are the hypotheses I had about the variables associated with improved implementation um, and how do they relate to each other in a, in a causal pathway? What I see in a lot of publications in implementation science that have less and less success in getting published is people will say something like, we use the consolidated framework for implementation research as our model for, you know, that's what guided our study. Well, it's not really a model, it's a framework, it's a list of variables. Um, which of those variables did you pick from which domain? What were your hypotheses about how they were related to each other, right? So that becomes really important. And the second thing is I see people state these frameworks or even state a causal model, but then the variables that they choose are not specifically linked to that model, right? That connection has to be very tight. Like here's the conceptual model we borrowed from. Um, here's how we may have adapted it for our particular setting. Here are the measures that we have that are associated with each domain or construct within uh, that, that, uh, that model. And that will lead to my last thing and then I'll stop because I'm sure people have questions and sorry, I didn't, I wasn't quite, I should, the other question I should have asked is how long do you want me to take, Megan? <laughs> but um, the, um, the last thing I'll say is that um, there are a lot of de novo measures in a lot of implementation science and people are moving away from that. And there are increasingly directories. So the Society for Implementation Research Collaborative or CERC and the University of Washington have a giant glossary of measures for different um, constructs within implementation science. And if you are thinking about testing those as potential mediating variables in implementation, I strongly encourage you to familiarize yourself with that measure those measurement batteries and to pick measures that are consistent with what has been used in the implementation science um, literature. I also have prepared a, a few thoughts about like sort of the implementation model that we have been using and the causal model we have been trying to test and publish and the successes and challenges we've had with that. But I, I'll put that on hold because I really want to hear from the other speakers as well. That's a great place to get us started, and I really appreciate that. So for those of you that are on the call, the things I want you to noodle about what David said, we're thinking about the evolution of um, implementation science publications over time and sort of how the bar is raising over time, that there are venues for publication if you're a methodologist and if you're advancing the science of implementation, and then potentially different venues if you are a content expert and are advancing the science of your own discipline. Um, but I'll pause there, and then I want to bring Dr. Katie Hoskins to the virtual floor and add a spotlight. And then Charlie, I'll come. I'll come to you next. But go ahead, Katie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm Katie Hoskins. I'm an assistant professor here at Penn in the School of Nursing. Um, by background, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner and spent a long time practicing clinically before I went back for a PhD. Um, and was really interested in implementation science before I even knew what implementation science was. And I feel like that's a lot of the journey that clinicians experience. Um, they see all these challenges in terms of working under organizational constraint and then see how implementation science really helps um, at least start to address some of those challenges. So I, I caught the implementation science bug during my doctoral program here at Penn and was very fortunate to complete the T32 postdoc in implementation research in the School of Medicine with, with David, um, which was a tremendous opportunity to really get into, get into implementation science and spend two years just being immersed in this space. Uh, my primary scholarship is focused on implementation of evidence-based interventions to prevent youth suicide. Um, and I have a particular interest in firearm-related lethal means safety, um, given that we've seen substantial rises in firearm suicide among youth. Um, much of my work is within health systems. I'm really interested in thinking about how we can do partner work within health systems 
And we're really interested in nurse-led innovation, which is a wide open space that's been happening in implementation science, but perhaps we haven't called it that. So thinking about how we can really leverage QI efforts within health systems and add an implementation science component to it. Um, when I was thinking about publishing and implementation science, a lot of my perspective is coming in as, as an early career researcher. And I, I appreciate it. And one of the things I was reflecting on as well is, is David's framing about how you come into this space, whether you're coming in as someone who's trying to build scholarship that's advancing the science of implementation. Um, some of my work has been around like implementation mapping and operationalizing that and thinking about how we develop methodology versus bringing implementation science to advance your content area. Um, other things that I think are important, particularly for early career folks that are coming into implementation science and thinking about publishing. Um, one of my first tips is just to think, is to, excuse me, is to talk about implementation science all the time. Um, one of the best assignments I got was to you know, describe implementation science in a five minute you know, elevator pitch or you're at a dinner party or think about you know, your 15 minute talk that you give at a lunch and learn versus a more formal you know, 45 minute presentation to your department. The more I talk about implementation science with my friends or my family that doesn't want to hear about it, or as I'm teaching it um, as part of our implementation science certificate program, it's helping me write about it. Um, so I think being able to, to really dive into the concepts and be conversant is a way to facilitate the fluency of your writing. Um, another tip is, is to really dive into learning the language of implementation science. There, there's so much lexicon here and, and trying to understand the terminology can be really difficult. But then once we understand it, I think there's the risk of reproducing gatekeeping. So our challenge then when we're thinking about publishing is how do we clearly translate and distill complex implementation science constructs to non-implementation science audiences, particularly as we're thinking about bringing implementation science into our area of content expertise and aiming to publish in non-implementation science journals. Um, kind of to elaborate on, on David's point as well, I, I think there's such importance in thinking about how we really nail our, our theories, models, and frameworks, and, and how those scaffold our work so that we're able to be conceptually consistent across our studies, particularly as we look to publish them. And, and having that, that coherence, that's so critical to make sure that we're not just picking and choosing models, frameworks, and, and haphazardly selecting variables from them. Um, and just before uh, I'll pause, but I think another piece of advice that's been helpful for me as I as I think about publishing is to read widely, um, get on journal listservs, like be aware of, kind of the latest information that's coming out um, from both implementation science journals as well as in your field. Um, it's been helpful for me to think about use cases and, and reading analogs as, as they may relate to my content area as I'm thinking about my framing for, for how I might publish my work. Um, I spend a lot of time reading study protocols. That's helpful for me as I think about designing future studies. Um, implementation science publishes so many study protocols that are really excellent and can serve as a nice springboard for developing your own work. Um, and then to dive into theory. Um, I've, been, I've been hearing things in some qualitative data I've been analyzing, and it, it made me think I need to learn normalization process theory from Carl May. So how can we really dive into theory that then translates back to our empirical work as we think about kind of advancing implementation science and doing this work um, to then move on to, to publish and disseminate? So I have some other ideas and suggestions, but we'll, we'll pause there. Um, and I think we're, we're going to popcorn over to, to Charlie. That was great, Katie. Thank you so much. Um, a couple of takeaways from yours, although, you know, there were many. Publishing as an early career researcher and thinking about what that entails. And I'll say when we get to the question and answer, maybe we can talk a little bit about authorship lists and authorship order, which I think is especially important to early career folks. You talked about talking about implementation science, which I thought was lovely because you do get more fluency when the ter with the terms when you just speak them. And I don't think people always appreciate that, that talking about the field can actually make them better communicators. You talked about conceptual consistency with your TMFs, which is the same thing that David brought up, which I think is really important, and making sure that you're not just naming theories, models, and frameworks, but actually using them and showing how you're using them. Um, and then you talked about study protocols, which we can come back to, which I think are phenomenal. But yes, I am going to throw to Charlie, Dr. Charlie Woods-Hill, and I'm going to spotlight her as well. But go ahead and start talking. All right, um, I'm a pediatric ICU doctor. I need structure, so I made slides. Uh <laughs> 
<laughs> no, please, okay, it's just a handful. Um, and um, honestly, we didn't the the um the pan we did not uh, share content or really um, what we were going to talk about ahead of time. But I think it's kind of funny. I feel like so many of the things that, that they just um, the doctors Mandel and Hoskins just said I really really can relate to. Um, uh, so um, I'm a PICU doctor. Um, I serendipitously stumbled into implementation science when I did a T32 in health policy, um, right, sort of my second year of being an attending here. Um, uh, met um, uh, met Renaud and Megan, realized like implementation science is the thing that I didn't even know I needed um, uh, and have sort of been honestly trying to, to either do both or transition from the second type of person David describes, um, somebody who's a, got sort of like a content area with some problems to fix um, and using implementation science to fix those. I'll talk a little bit about what it means specifically. Um, but I'm also increasingly, I think, interested in becoming more of a content neutral implementation scientist, although still sort of embedded in my critical care space. Um, uh, and I'm just having like a heck of a lot of fun doing it. Um, but I have published in zero implementation science journals, guys, zero. I've never submitted a single paper to implementation science. I feel like I should confess that. Um, and I think it's okay. Um, so, so what do I, what do I do and how, how do I use implementation science? I, I sort of divide myself, I think, into kind of three categories. Um, there is this content specific work in this very specific clinical question area um, that is in a, a body of work that's been going on for about a decade now called the Bright Star Collaborative. Um, and then separate from that, um, there is a, um, a wonderful already existing um, pediatric ICU research collaborative network called Polizi um, that's been around for about 20 years and does amazing collaborative research. And I inserted myself into that existing group um, and created an implementation science subgroup um, to kind of leverage that existing structure. Um, and they were kind enough to be welcoming. Um, and that has been a lot of fun um, since 2021. Um, and then the third category is sort of this, um, and I don't wanna say wastebasket in a negative way, but sort of um, potpourri of health policy projects. And it's been a dream of mine for a long time to weave together so much of the, the content that I learned in my health policy masters back with the implementation science methodology that I, that I really love. Um, so that's kind of what I do. So Bright Star, I'll just give you sort of, um, for the people who are um, focused on a specific clinical question or topic, I'll give you an example of what I do. So Bright Star is this multi-center diagnostic stewardship project. It's a, very, it's a super simple project. The basic concept is there's this one specific kind of blood test called a blood culture. Um, it's super duper overused. Like we send it constantly without thinking. We don't think it's a big deal at all to send it. Um, when kids, for example, have a fever in the ICU, we send this test in case they have an infection. Um, but it drives unnecessary antibiotics. And that actually is a really big deal for multiple reasons in critically ill kids. So this is a super simple premise, which is if we actually sent fewer blood cultures, we were better diagnostic stewards, does that transition into fewer unnecessary antibiotics? So the first phase is that which was truly sort of QI and some interrupted time series analysis and sort of a very, um, not, not really implementation science at all. But, you know, we had, we were, we had no evidence of um, efficacy or effectiveness, right? We were totally just trying to, to do proof of concept here. So the answer happily turned out to be yes. So now that has launched happily for me into multiple spinoff projects, um, one of which is now part of my K, um, which was funded by NHLBI, totally focused and like all in on implementation science. I'm, I'm sort of early career like Katie, although she just submitted and got an amazing um, bunch of comments on her R01. So um, kudos to that lovely lady. Um, but the phase that I'm in right now, now of this um, is doing a hybrid um, pilot in eight new sites, trying to sort of test and explore different strategies, all again focused on blood culture stewardship, um, saying, hey, we sort of showed you can do this in, in about 18 sites sort of over a few years, and now we are really focusing on the how. How do you get picky clinicians to most effectively become stewards of this test? So that's like, you know, about like I said, it's about a third of me, right? I go and give a lot of talks to ID doctors and PICU clinicians and antibiotic stewards. And I put the, put those, those projects in a lot of um, PICU and ID journals. And there's this eclipse, like I said, I inserted myself with Heather Wolf, who I think might be on this, um, another um, wonderful intensivist and implementation scientist with me at CHOP. Um, and so we said like, we need a group of people who are intensive, pediatric intensivists who are into implementation science. And if they're not into implementation science, they should be because it's everything. Um, and so we just created it. Um, like I said, it, it was, um, we, we harnessed this sort of existing infrastructure. It was a, this meeting happens twice a year. We didn't have to like, we don't have to book a room. We don't have to like, do, we just literally like joined and said, we're, hey, now we're this like subgroup. Um, can we please do this? And they were like, okay. Um, so that was great, but we weren't gonna take no for an answer. Um, 
And we've done, um, so we're sort of newish. This We start, we really launched in 2021. We've done a variety of projects. And this is where I talk, it's like, now it's getting a little bit more content neutral, right? So I'll pick you, but it's like, it has nothing to do with blood cultures. Um, but one of the first things we did was write this white paper um, because we felt like we really needed to get the message about implementation science out to a peds critical care audience. So that was fun. Um, coming up is going to be um, led by Sarah Malone from WashU, who's now the co-chair with me of Eclipse for the next couple of years, um, a systematic review of barriers and facilitators in the ICU setting. Great question, right? Like, have we done enough to understand barriers and facilitators to um, clinical practice changes in the ICU specifically? Or do we need to keep doing, right? How do we need to really keep assessing context like this every time? Or like, sort of, do we actually know at this point? I think I actually truly don't know the answer to this question. I actually think this is going to be a really interesting project to do as an example. Um, and we've got some funded stuff coming out of this group, which like makes us, I think, super, super proud. Um, so um, Kate Steffen, who's an intensivist at Stanford, um, uh, we are collaborating through Eclipse on her RIT, and that, just, that is funded. Um, there's an R21 pro proposal coming up. So like, you know, this is like, um, it took a little bit, I think, to like gain steam, but like, um, but it's going well. Um, and then there's a firearm storage pilot too, which I'll talk about a bit. Um, and so in this third section, it said sort of health policy and miscellaneous. Um, uh, now it really sort of like goes off the rails in terms of content, but I think it's okay because it's all, this is where I like, I'm like, please just let me play around with implementation science methods that I find super, super fascinating. As long as it's still for me relates to the, the overall goal of improving pediatric health outcomes, um, because that is who I am um, as a clinician. So there is, um, and Katie, um, this sort of like intersects really nicely with some of her work, but um, focusing on um, safe firearm storage programs, um, we have a pilot, for example, that's integrating that um, process for the first time into the, the PICU setting, which is to, to like sort of, there's no precedent really for doing that um, outside of primary care or ED settings at the moment. Um, uh, that was a, a pilot in the CHOP PICU that's been pretty successful so far. Um, and the goal is to sort of, um, have this become multi-center, multi-phase work through that Eclipse group. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff like geospatial analysis of firearm hotspots, a question about unintentional injury in the PICU. Um, I'm mentoring some fellows, which has been super fun for me about projects. I'm in Botswana and Ghana, um, helping them incorporate um, implementation science um, aspects into their projects. Um, and so uh, that is what I do. So where have I published? Like I said, absolutely nowhere in an implementation science journal, all clinical stuff. Um, just a couple examples. So um, JAMA Peds is where we published the main Bright Star stuff. Um, uh, that was a lot more QI than IS, but our follow-up paper used the CSAT tool, for example, for sustainability. Peds Critical Care Medicine is where that white paper went, um, sort of saying like, hey guys, implementation science is, is here and you need to pay attention. Um, and a couple survey papers as well. Peds Quality and Safety is where I put an interview paper using the CIFR to gather data about determinants of blood culture overuse. American Journal of Infection Control, um, a survey of PICU nurses using the COMBI model focusing on bloodstream infection reduction. And then Peds Emergency Care, really outside, a little bit outside my clinical um, space, but it was about evaluating a point of care ultrasound program um, using the CIFR ERIC matching tool. Um, so that is what I have done. Um, and then I have just like a couple um, sort of challenges and lessons learned. And I think the first one you've heard from both of the other folks already, which is just be savvy about who your target audience is. You want to, as much as sometimes I get like, I feel like very anxious and like have imposter syndrome that I've never published in an implementation science journal. Um, but it's more important that the ped like pediatricians that a clinical audience that pick you people read what I'm doing. Like that's still what's more important to the, the, the body of my work. And so that has to just sort of trump getting a paper in a journal X. Um, I think when you're writing for a clinical audience, just like sort of be careful with balancing the IS jargon with the core message. It's, it's interesting. I actually don't, I don't think it's easier to write an implementation science project into a clinical journal than it is to write a really sophisticated IS project into an IS journal. I, I don't, I maybe can't speak to that second half because I told you I haven't done it yet, but um, you know, the you get reviewers are sometimes like really confused and not entirely sure. You have to sort of be able to like make them understand, right? Like what you are doing. Um, and you sort of assume that they may not know anything about um, about a model, um, about the outcomes that you care about. What is a hybrid study? So you have to like be prepared. I think just kind of like to navigate that very carefully. And sometimes that can be sort of um, just prepare yourself for like a, a fair amount of back and forth with reviewers um, until you sort of get that balance right. And the converse, if you are sort of like targeting more of an audience, audience, like make sure you're really on solid methodological ground because they're gonna, as David said, they don't just wanna hear, we use the CFER to do some interviews. Like, mm -mm, that's not gonna cut it anymore. Um, and then if what you need to cite 
doesn't exist, just write it yourself, which is what why we did that white paper for Pete's critical care medicine, because Heather and, and many of us at top and, and sort of across this community were like, you know, we're so we just need we need like one thing that our core audience is gonna is gonna read and be able to like latch on to so we can sort of say this is what we mean. These are the methods, these are the questions, these are the outcomes, like this is, you know, um, and so we just that didn't exist for us. And so we wrote it. Um, and so I said, um, and I see Dr. I like structure and so, and I don't like um, being told no. So we just get, get things done. I think that's okay too. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. That's phenomenal, Charlie. Thank you. Um, I'll add a spotlight to me. And this is perfect because we wanted to spend about half the time hearing from you all and your preliminary um, sort of impressions and, and takeaways for people. Charlie, from yours, I think the way that you highlighted your portfolio of projects was lovely and sort of showing people that you can have um, a sort of full and heterogeneous research agenda and portfolio, that you have this collaborative of writing partners. And I think we underestimate the power in having a group of people that you can write with. And, and a lot of the people that I know who are successful in implementation science have done that. And so they have their sort of crew that they write with and that helps a lot. And then another point that you made about that you don't have to publish in implementation science journals, even if you're doing IS work. So I think all of those are really important. So we're going to translate or transition into a moderated discussion. I have a few questions for the panelists, but I'll invite our participants to put questions in the chat as well. And we do have a lot of IS published authors in our audience as well. So if you want to speak up and share your insights, we're happy to hear them. I guess my first question for this group will be, if you think about how you parse out the number of papers in a project that includes implementation science, how do you approach that? Because it's it's not one paper per project, right? It could be three or four or six or seven. So how do you curate the story or think about doing that? I, I can take a crack at it. Char Charlie, unless you were about to. I was actually going to say, I have, um... I found this to be very challenging, and I think this is. Um, I was going to imagine that you have a lot of wisdom about this, you specifically, as somebody who's <laughs> younger. Um, yes, yes. I, I wisdom bull in a china shop. I'm not sure. So, all right. So, so at the beginning of every project, I sit down with the investigative team, and we come up with a list of what are all the papers that are going to come out of this, right? And so we have an Excel spreadsheet that is um, a list of those papers. And then we ask who wants to be involved. And we, I tend to be a more the merrier kind of person. And so we will list, um, we will list everybody who said they would like to be involved. So now we have a work, which is the list of papers and the potential authors. And then comes the trickier part about who's going to take the lead on this paper. Part of that has to do, I don't know the extent to which people are on this call are, are part of the pen system, but, um, but part of it has to do, you really need to think about, especially for early stage folks, about what counts most towards your academic success. At Penn, the School of Medicine co-op makes no distinction between first and last authorship. So it is very, very common during the, when your dossier is being reviewed by the School of Medicine co-op, for them to say, this person has X publications, Y of which were first or last month. They get lumped together. So this creates a wonderful opportunity for sharing and for, but it to still count as much as it would otherwise when you are, um, uh, when, when you are coming up for promotion and people see that on your, on your, on your CV. So we, we try to be strategic about that and give, folks who are not yet promoted opportunities to be first or last author. But if you are PI, if this is your project, you should own that. Don't give away stuff that you shouldn't give away, right? If this is your intellectual property, you make sure, like if this is something you are, that you are passionate enough about to sweat blood to write a proposal about, like you should be first author of the first paper that comes out of that. And sort of related to that is, yes, there are a lot of papers that could come out of these things, but um, uh, uh, Laura Ellen, absolutely. Methodologists, statisticians, it's often a very different uh, situation, but you don't, wanna, um, you don't wanna scoop yourself, right? And so think about the most important paper 
that's going to come out of your, and it's okay to publish protocol papers and some like methods papers. Um, we are, I'm involved in a collaborative care clinical trial right now. We are still collecting data, but we've published four papers. One is a protocol paper and three are, this is our clinical model. So we're putting a stake in the ground about how our model differs from other uh, models. They tend to go to lower impact journals and that's okay. Right? But before you publish anything from your results, make sure you are publishing that main paper first, right? So, and don't let other stuff come before. So that really is, well, what if there's a holdup? What if people are like taking too long, right? So we have regular paper meetings. Like once the data are collected, we have regular paper meetings. We have that Excel spreadsheet in our, and I can actually, I'm happy to share this. We've actually put together an Excel template that is like the paper title, the authors involved, the stage of the paper, the date of that stage. And what we'd say is we, we set a timeline. And if the first author has not moved the paper forward within the accepted timeline, it can, someone else can say, you know, I would like to move this forward. I'm very interested in that. And so no hard feelings. Everybody has competing responsibilities. And so, and the first author say, might say, no, 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 I need a week. In a week, I'll have it. Right, and if it doesn't happen in a week, then we are like, okay, we need to move this paper forward for the sake of the project, and someone else on that author list can elect to be first author, and and move. Um, we have never had a problem with this. It has never resulted in bad feelings. It has never like, and it has moved papers forward quickly because people because there's an element of public shaming, and there is like, and as someone said, there is like a real transparency part of this, and we set expectations very clearly up, uh, up front. And I don't think this is an implementation science thing. I think this is just any time you're conducting a study where there's going to be more than one paper that, uh, that comes out. So those are great insights. And I'll I'll add on, I think the transparency is really important. And, and we've got a call out there in the chat, the same idea. I do something very similar. Also have an Excel spreadsheet of all the papers that are going to, you know, anticipated papers that are going to come out of an initiative. You've heard people talk about the protocol paper. So if you're doing an intervention study, writing up the protocol um, is one way to get an early paper to sort of put your stake in the ground and say, look, we're here. You might not hear from us again for three to seven years, but <laughs> here we are. Um, you know, methods papers are common. If you're doing a hybrid study, an implementation paper, and then an effectiveness paper, and then maybe a sustainment paper, but, but these are often multi-paper um, projects. Katie, can I ask you to speak to this question? How do you think about, you know, the the portfolio of papers that might come out of a project? I, I um, had just dropped in the chat. I think to David's point, like having this very transparent governance structure is so helpful. I think particularly for newer folks too, who are, who are learning the process and needing that very explicit mentorship within working within large teams um, in which there's many folks involved. Um, definitely a, a agree with the with the prior comments. The one thing I would add is thinking about where can you layer on commentary papers as your empirical work is developing or kind of cooking along as a way to really uh, disseminate, maybe not lessons learned, but really kind of intellectual insights or theoretical insights, things that you, you've gained from the process that help advance the science or, or helpful for other researchers as well. And I think those are things that, that sometimes it's helpful to get the empirical out work um, out ahead of time, but there may be kind of windows of opportunity that, that you can layer that on in order to enhance the learning and the dissemination from the work. I'm so glad you brought that up. And, you know, every field has editorials and commentaries. My experience of implementation science is that it's even more important. These commentaries are sort of helping people think through mm -hmm. important sticky concepts in the field. So I'm so glad that you brought that up. One, um, one of the papers, oh, oh, wait, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say to that point, like one of the papers we're developing right now is, is the process, how we developed an equity informed audit and feedback implementation strategy and piloted it um, and, and lessons, things that we gained in terms of the complexity of doing that work. So it's not an empirical paper. There's no data, but we learned a lot in terms of the method development that we're hoping will advance um, and be helpful for other scholars who, who want to keep innovating on this work. Wonderful. Charlie, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to respond to this question of sort of putting together the story. Um, for publishing, for kind of yeah. Papers, yeah. So, and I will say the um, a very good lesson that I took from all the Bright Star work um, from the from the PI and the mentor on that work um, uh, was it's I in the beginning I found it like 
I was like, is this off-puttingly formal? Are people going to shy away from this? But it's worked really well. We have a very formal authorship agreement, um, like a signed, dated authorship agreement, um, essentially at the, at the beginning of the of the projects. Um, and, um, you know, he sort of, you know, we had 14 sites. We were going to spend about three years with them. He sort of, he was, you know, said, we're gonna, the goal is right to get multiple papers out of this. It's a lot of work. The goal is not to get one paper. Um, and it's very good to be upfront ahead of time about, um, cause he's gonna, you know, he, he made me think about things that I hadn't thought about, which is, um, you know, what about side projects that come up, come out of this, right? There might be like a spinoff, a couple sites may say like, oh my gosh, we're super interested in like this element. You know, can we, can like just these three sites look at data together? Is that theirs? Is that ours? Like, are we, um, you know, and then we realized as our work went along, um, we had more and more um, excitement and interest in some, in more of the implementation aspects of the collaborative. And we're trying to figure out like, do all of the site leads, you know, all those two site leads per 14 sites, it's 28 authors, right? Are they all on, for example, our paper about sustainability or are they not? Because, you know, like, and so um, we just sort of, he set some kind of metrics right up front, basically said, you know, if we're using data from your site and you meet sort of the um, I'm, I'm JCE criteria sort of for authorship, like this is how we're going to do it. Uh, but we had to kind of limit, right? It was a collaborative. We couldn't have five or seven authors per site. It was two. And they had to tell us who they were going to be uh, and sign it. And and nobody balked. I really thought that I was like, we, this is like kind of mean. Like, I don't want to like, especially at the beginning where we have nothing. We're just like excited that they said yes to do this thing with us and excited somebody to give us some money to do it. Um, and um but it worked. It worked very well. I what I what I need to do now for myself is sort of take that model from that particular part of my work. I think and inject elements of it into like implementation science collaboratives and um, and to sort of avoid. I think the transparency upfront, the clear expectations avoids. Um, uh, Heather probably remembers there were some painful parts about writing our implementation science white paper in terms of, um, you know, I didn't do a great job of setting expectations of the timeline, for example, for some of the co-authors. And it's you know, people are busy clinically and, and in life and with other things. And, um, you know, that paper probably took uh, about six months longer than it should have. Um, uh, and so that was a, a for sure a lesson learned. Um, there. That's really helpful. Thank you. And love to hear about where there have been bumps in the road. And certainly I've encountered those bumps when I wasn't transparent upfront about authorship. So really useful. Um, Rebecca Ham has a question about publishing the implementation aim of a type one or type two hybrid trial, which might not feel like it goes in the primary paper if your primary paper is focused on effectiveness. It's too implementation science-y for the clinical journals, but it's not implementation science-y enough for the IS journals who might not see it as advancing the field. So thoughts about that and a related question of how do you publish that implementation work if the effectiveness outcomes are negative? Ooh. Sorry, I didn't mean to make it so hard. <laughs> no, I mean, this is, it's a meaty question. So I wanted to, for years, uh, so I have, I am the proud PI of two null large <laughs> red monsters. So, and in both cases, I was dissuaded from publishing an article called What We Planned, What Happened, and Why We Were Wrong. And so I, I think that your, the, the implementation aim of a null trial, I mean, we did publish, though. We did, they just, nobody else wanted to call it that. I was very excited about that. Um, uh, the, uh, but I think that publishing the implementation aim on a null trial is exactly that, trying to unpack what happened, right? Is it that the intervention was not effective or it was not implemented the way that it was designed and what happened so that it was not implemented the way that it was designed? Um, related to publishing the implementation separate, aim separately with a, um, with a positive uh, 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 trial finding, so most trials are, it's an intent to treat design, right? And what you're publishing is, is intent to treat, right? And so that leaves you with the question of dose response, um, which we can apply to implementation science. And so where we have had success is looking at, you know, the implementation aspects, especially fidelity as a dose and how that moderated the outcome of interest or thinking about it as an effect modifier. And then also looking at factors that may have influenced that dose as our factors that we hypothesize were going to affect implementation. 
That's really helpful. I think part of it is about the story that you're telling. You know, mm -hmm. what what do you want them to take away from it? What are they going to what new thing will they know or what thing will they do differently as a result of of reading what you've done? And I really like, you know, that approach of thinking of what are the effect modifiers or or mediators of a relationship that you're trying to to understand? Can you look at the spread in acceptability of an intervention and does that explain, you know, something about organization level adoption or something. Um, but there, there, I think there are ways to, to tell that story. Um, in the interest of getting some more questions, I'm gonna move on to, looks like Lee Writings has a question about when you're publishing protocol papers, are hypertypes one and two studies of interest to IS journals in addition to type threes? I have a thought, but what do you all think? I could just say it. I, I actually sent a hypertype one protocol to implementation science and they said, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> and it's not entirely surprising, right? Because a type one hybrid trial is really focused on effectiveness and you're gathering information about implementation. But if you're targeting a journal that is trying to advance the field of implementation, many of them are, they're not going to see a type one is doing that. So um, I would say it's probably more straightforward to get your, your type twos or threes published there. And I will also say that the process of getting your protocol paper published is easier if you have extramural grant funding, in part because it's been peer reviewed. That's what they're looking at. It's like, oh, someone's vetted this, decided to give it money. And so the process of getting it into print is a lot easier than if you're doing um, unfunded work. So Heather Wolf has a question about folks who published in non-IS-based journals and how do you get around the word limitations <laughs> given the large amount of qual work that we often need to do in early stage projects. She uses lots of tables with quotes, as do I. Are there better ways? Uh, like a hundred supplements. <laughs> right. I, <clears throat> Heather, we've talked about, yeah, I um, I do think this is really, this is really difficult. I have, um, it's not like my end for this is huge, but I have definitely, um, separated out as its own paper the qualitative parts so that I at least only had the qualitative work to try to get into 3,000 words that's still not easy but at least it was only one element of it um and then literally just used like probably had like somewhere between six and ten supplements for one of the um for one of them that I published um but in our in pizza critical care she's well aware there's sort of a yeah, it's not, there's not, it's not that easy to sort of like get a lot of interest um, still in qualitative work. We don't have like a great home for qualitative work in a PEDS critical care journal. Um, so we sort of have to shop things around. I don't know if that is easier or harder in other clinical spaces or content spaces, but, um, um, but I get around it with supplements and separating them. I am a lover of appendices and supplements, Katie. <laughs> I was just going to suggest too. I think I think it depends again, like on on your publishing strategy and who your audience is. But thinking about really targeting pure qualitative journals, like qualitative health research, social science and medicine has a a new qualitative focused journal um, that's really excellent, um, producing high quality work. But the word limits are are much more expansive because they recognize the the need to apply um, and and to be more comprehensive in the thematic descriptions and including quotes and things like that that do take up more space than kind of some more, more traditional biomedically focused journals as well. So th being creative again, like where you might go that gives you that flexibility. If you really want to maintain um, your qualitative work as you maybe perhaps originally wrote it without hoping to, to slice and dice it down too much. So relevant to the discussion about qual, Allison Stevens says that uh, their team has had difficulty publishing qualitative studies if it's connected to a quant study in any way and have gotten this feedback from multiple IS journals. Allison, I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Not to put you on the spot. It's okay sure. if you don't. Can oh, you yeah. Hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, sorry, Go for I'm it. I'm in a waiting room at a doctor's office. So, um, so basically we have studies where we've done, for example, like survey, you know, research, and it's also included like a qualitative component. And the when we try to just take and isolate the qualitative component of it, then when we, you know, submit to something that's qualitative, it's like, oh no, this is not a true qualitative study. 
um, even though we've done the, you know, the qualitative analysis, it was obviously a key part in this. So we've had trouble with being able to parse that out, um, to focus in on the qualitative. And sometimes we're running into issues on the flip side, but it's more common on the qualitative side. So that's a good, it's a good point. I think without knowing, you know, exactly what you've published, what I look for as a reviewer when I see qual sort of pulled away from quant is I'm trying to make sure, is this the least publishable unit issue? And I'm not saying you're doing this, but that's what comes to mind as a reviewer. They're like, oh, they're just trying to get as many papers out of this as they can. So if you know that that's going to be a criticism, then I think you get out in front of it and you say, this is the rationale for presenting the qualitative data separately, that maybe there's an emergent finding or an emergent question as you're doing the process and you say, oh, this needs its own in-depth treatment. This analytic approach is going to be very different. That And there is a specific research question that needs to be answered only with the qualitative data. So from my perspective, it has a lot to do with the framing, um, okay. but it it's not a guarantee, but that's, that's sort of what I look for as a reviewer. And I'm like, oh, they just took all the open-ended responses from the survey and they want to make that a paper. Right. So, I mean, I can be transparent here. I mean, it was a, a paper that we did in partnership with, you know, CDC, AU, Gov, a bunch of organizations, and it was related to parents um, and their relationships to their children during the pandemic. And part of it was related to whether these, you know, sort of manifested c concerns about child abuse and all these things that were just supposed to happen because children were at home with their fam families. And we looked at a lot of different things. Oh, and AAP was also a part of this. And so, yes, some of that has been published on the AAP side as far as how it relates to some of the clinical protocols. But we really feel that the lived experience of parents and hearing from them exactly what happened is important from the qualitative perspective. So it's it isn't an add on, um, but yeah, that that's been the struggle. So just to give the the context, maybe that might be more. I appreciate that. I think there are some journals that would probably be receptive to that. I think the ones that Katie mentioned make sense. And then I'm on the editorial board of Global Implementation Research and Applications, and we not uncommonly will publish papers in implementation science that are sort of the second look at a, a study that's already been done. So let's take these data, sort of ask a question in a different way, and then present a finding that is a new finding of interest to the community. So a pre-submission inquiry to the editorial board could potentially help you a little bit there, but David, I saw you nodding. I don't know if you have thoughts about this too. I, I was, so, right. So let's say you've published the quant paper, the findings, and now you have all these rich qualitative data that you want to, um, that you that you want to share with the world. I would really own the quant, right? So we published this quantitative paper. We had these findings. It showed either that this thing worked, but not why it worked, or it didn't work, and we were all really stumped by that. And so now we are taking this deeper dive using these qualitative data to specifically um, try and answer those questions. And I think sometimes, like many, if, if you were like me, and I came to qualitative research late, and did receive some formal training in it, but we're like really like um, on this grounded theory bandwagon, like this idea that, you know, we are blank slates, the world is a blank slate, and we are just going to take our data and let it like sort of create theory and hypotheses for us, rather than taking a much more targeted approach, like it didn't work. And we think like, here are some possible reasons why, and we used it like, and, and, and take like a, like a, well, what I said, like a much more targeted approach to using the qualitative data to parse what happened. And I think that has a couple of advantages. One is it helps to situate the reader immediately in why you're doing this. And the second is it takes less. Um, and, uh, and you don't have to, like, because you're not necessarily showing everything, just like you're not doing every possible statistical analysis on a quantitative data set that you, uh, that you have. And so we've had some success. The paper I put in the chat is one where we had, um, we found in this RCT we did, not only did the intervention, was the intervention not effective, but it had an iatrogenic effect in that teachers stopped doing a, um, some evidence-based practices we've been training them in. And so we merged that analysis with the qualitative data 
to try and understand why. But it was, yeah, it was super targeted in that way. And we were able to fit both analyses into one. Great, I hope that helps. Um, I want to get to Venetia Verma's question about guidance on reporting intervention fidelity in a large scale multi-center health system intervention. So how do you think about presenting fidelity? And maybe the 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 asker could be a little more um, specific about Katie. Although, sorry, you look like you might have. Uh, uh, Manisha, can you say a little bit more about what you're looking for for that fidelity um, question? Sure. Yeah, sure, Megan. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Yeah. So I I feel um I mean implementation science is wonderful, but the replication and generalizability requires some sort of you know understanding of what did you do. What exactly happened? And given the diverse systems, resources, allocation, and you know barriers and challenges internalized, it is very hard to really understand whether their intervention is going to work, work equally good at my place. So I wondered if there are any standard reporting guidelines, which said, as a part of implementation science work, you need to report your implementation with these five core elements so that other people can kind of make sure that at least the implementation effectiveness, which was done before, is same. And now you are actually testing the next question of sustainability and generalizability. So yeah, I appreciate that clarification. There are reporting guidelines. So I will drop a link into the chat for one of them, which is Starry. Um, but maybe I can ask our panelists to speak to how do you talk about the sort of specific contexts in which you're working, and, and address that challenge of trying to create transferable knowledge so that people, the reader can understand, you know, the degree to which what you're reporting is relevant to their context. Um, I guess I would just say by being totally honest, I haven't done it yet. My plan is to use Starry for um, when I do go to report what happens with this hybrid that I'm doing right now. Um, I found it very, um, helpful, structured, relatively specific and clear in terms of um, uh, the things that I'm going to need to keep my eye on as this evolves. Like, what am I actually paying attention to? Um, what do I need to plan to write up? Um, but um, but I'm curious if David or Katie or Megan have, have either actually used it yet or have used something else. Um, I do think it is um, challenging for sure. I, you get, I don't want to say you get away with it a little bit more when you're putting IS stuff into clinical journals, but I think you, I don't think they get how important that, I don't think they are like are quite um, as sort of like sophisticated in terms of the IS piece there to understand that that's a big issue and that it needs to be so structured and so crystal clear. I think they're, they're like, thanks for telling us anything about what you did because, um, but I think certainly in, um, you know, if I was, if I, tried to sort of, you know, maybe get my, um, what happens with my project into implementation science, I think they will expect um, something quite um, formal. Katie, I think you were gonna say something. I'm nodding vigorously and echoing. I, I think this is a really important, um, important issue and one I haven't experienced yet, but we think about how important it is to have that really rich contextual description um, and really detail what we did so that our findings are transferable and, and can really live beyond the immediate study and the immediate publication. Um, so definitely eager if, if folks have other insights there as well, because how do we really communicate what we want within word limits um, is I think the, the thematic uh, challenge we've been hearing a bit about th uh, throughout the conversation today. I would say I've used Starry. I really like it. I think it does give you some structure for reporting some of that contextual nuance. I agree with Charlie that I think clinical journals sometimes give you a pass on this. I've seen people use Squire, which is the quality improvement reporting guideline, which actually has a lot of similar elements. But one of the nice things that, about using Starry in a clinical journal is that it gives you a rationale for going into that contextual detail that a clinical journal might otherwise go, what is all of this? <laughs> There are all of these words here, and you're like, well, this is what the reporting guideline says. So I, I do think it's really important, and my method sections are usually really long for that reason, and then I'll sometimes spill over into um, appendices to describe context even more. So we'll, uh, we'll start or, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, we'll start living in an appendix then often? Yes. I'll actually put the whole checklist. I'll fill right. it out where it is in the manuscript, and I'll put it in an appendix. Um, Laura Ellen, I think you raised your hand. 
Uh, I am seeing the time. So I, I would just say as someone who my first kind of um, big person job in implementation science was running a very complex hybrid type three trial, uh, don't recommend that as your foray into leading implementation science, but I learned a lot. And I will say one of the things as I was helping to plan um, how we were going to do what we proposed to do in the grant is that even papers that use Starry, even when things were well described, there's still all of that additional nuance of like, what did it actually look like to use audit and feedback, right? What did your external facilitation actually look like and how long did it take? And so I think that is an area for growth in the field. And I just wonder if there's something more that we can put into, and this is a challenge to myself as well, that we can put into those additional files and things to help provide some guidance about, hey, these are all of the things. And guess what? We didn't do it perfectly, right? Like we didn't have full fidelity to our implementation strategies, but we tried. Um, so those are my thoughts. That's great. And I think that's a great way to conclude. We're just about at the top of the hour. So I will thank our panelists for their tremendous insights. Thank you to the audience. We have saved the chat. We will send that out to you and have a wonderful day and, and good luck in publishing. Bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank good you. Good luck. <laughs>